Great. So hello everyone and thank you for the invitation. As uh, Virginia said, I'm Norani Nicola and I'm working in Lyon. Uh, and I'll be talking about the preprint I published. You have the archive link uh, on the first slide here. And um, But before getting to the heart of the article, I will try to say a few words on my domain of study, which is observational cosmology. Uh, basically, I'm trying to contribute better to um, the, uh, the to better determination of cosmological parameters, such as the proportion of matter in the universe, by doing direct observation of the sky. Uh, one of the most easy and powerful way to do that is to measure a star's observed uh, luminosity through its apparent magnitude. Uh, could you tell me if you see my cursor? Uh, yes. I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you um, measure the, uh, its magnitude, you subtract to it its absolute magnitude, which is the intrinsic quantity of light it emitted, and then you compare that value um, to the expected, expected result derived from general relativity, which is here, and that involves the redshift uh, z. The, and the three cosmological parameters, assuming a flat universe here, that are the proportion of radiation, radiation energy, uh, mass, and dark energy. For those who may not be used to that, I don't know, I've been told there were some uh, different uh, fields, uh, people here. Um, the redshift is a proxy for distance slash time, with one plus z being the ratio of the, the uh, universe current age, uh, versus its age when that light was emitted. It, it, this will have uh, an, in, in, an importance uh, a bit afterwards. Uh, here is a graphical representation of this distance modulus uh, evolution with the redshift that follows a log curve as expected. Uh, the colored points correspond to measured data from different surveys of diving the sky. This plot shows us that we need data that are close to us and data that are as far as, as z equal one, uh, meaning objects that were emitted when, uh, oh, I'm sorry, objects that emitted the light when the universe was half its age. And we also see that we need both precise measurements of apparent magnitude, of course, but also a good knowledge of each object, uh, object's absolute magnitude with the least dispersion possible. Not all celestial bodies can be used for that reason because we don't know their absolute magnitude. So this kind of study is done on a specific kind of celestial bodies, which are the supernovae and mostly type 1a supernovae. Supernovae are incredibly luminous events resulting from the death of a star, which we call its progenitor. Um, for, for instance, uh, a supernova alone can emit a higher light flux than a whole galaxy, but just for a very short time, tens of days ma maximum. Um, and there are different types of supernovae, but type 1a supernovae share a common underlying explosion mechanism. That makes them the most stable objects, and they are called standard candles for that fact. They also have the advantage to be visible from very far away and to grow in number with time, giving us uh, a self-increased statistic over the years. We just have to point out the sky and wait for the event to happen. But even with this shared explosion mechanism, there is an uncertainty about the intrinsic luminosity leading to a raw uh, dispersion of distance of around 20%, which is clearly not enough to, to, to measure correctly the cosmological par parameters. To reduce this uncertainty, we had to study other characteristics of uh, uh, the supernovae. Uh, we studied the, the maximum, uh, the apparent magnitude, but when observing the sky, we checked for new supernovae every night by acquiring one object's observed luminosity through time for different wavelengths, which is what we call a live curve, light curve. This plot represents the light curve of, of one uh, particular supernova a time being on the x-axis and the flux on the y-axis. From this curve, we define its color, the difference of magnitude between the uh, green and blue bands, and its stretch, which is a proxy for its explosion duration. So how did that help in, in uh, reducing the 
the, the dispersion. It helped because these two parameters uh, are linearly correlated with a, super, a supernova's luminosity. It is described by the brighter, slower relation uh, and the brighter, bluer relation. It means that, for, for instance, a spinner that is faint, so here on the y-axis, tends to have a lower stretch, which means it explodes faster. Uh, and uh, a brighter supernova will tend to be bluer uh, than uh, a faint one. This led to the use of a standardized uh, magnitude, absolute magnitude, that brought that distance dispersion to around 8%, enabling, enabling recent parameter to have the 2011 Nobel Prize for the measurement of the cosmological parameters that prove the accelerated expansion of the universe. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, what's left to do? Uh, well, we can continue to improve the statistics of our study. In fact, when making uh, these measurements, we suppose that the mean absolute magnitude of the supernova is the same at all redshifts, and that's fine for the first reading, but we actually have reasons to think that it doesn't. In fact, there is a correlation between a supernova's magnitude and its environment, which we'll present in a few slides. So if there is a link between environment and redshift, we could have an idea of how supernova's magnitudes evolve with redshift. Okay, how do we test that? One parameter that has a lot of chance to help us uh, in studying a potential redshift, redshift evolution is the stretch, the duration of the explosion, because it's mostly not effective, affected by in the interstellar medium, whereas the color does, for instance. It's uh, proper to uh, the supernova. But first, we need some data. So lots of survey <coughs> acquire supernovae's redshift and stretches. And here is, for instance, the histograms of three surveys that we will use in our data set, the SDSS, Spencer, and SNS-1, with the redshift on the x-axis. It's the same uh, redshift span for the three uh, histograms here. And uh, the number of supernovae observed in each pin. What we see directly is that each of these surveys starts to see less and less supernovae after a certain uh, redshift limit, but that limit is different for each of them. It stems simply from the fact that every telescope has a limit of detection, so at some point uh, you start missing the faintest, faintest supernovae that were deemed to, due to the distance. That would be totally fine if not for the fact that as we just said, the faintest supernovae here are also the one with the low stretch. This has an impact on the stretch distribution of the supernovae after that maximum. Uh, and it's called the Malmquist bias. It comes from the selection effects of the instrument. Uh, then the only supernovae that are not affected by this bias are the ones below this limit for each survey, and we call such samples complete, meaning free from selection effects. But as you can see uh, here, we, we chose two curves for each of these surveys. The one on the right, the farthest one, is where we determine the limit uh, should be for each survey. It has a good statistic while giving us a complete sample, and is called the fiducial sample. But because we want to make sure to be free from selection bias, we also took more rigorous cuts, the closest one. Uh, they are called the conservative cuts. They only serve as a comparison to make sure we are free from these effects. And so for the rest of the analysis, um, and the fiducial sample will be the reference one because of its good statistic. And as such, it will be in opaque markers starting next slide, while the conservative results will be in transparent. In addition to these no selection effects free samples, sorry, I switch, um, we used SNF and HST uh, data, which were already complete, and made one big stretch sample from all these five individual surveys. The stretch distribution is shown here. Uh, with the redshift in log scale on the x-axis and uh, the cumulative histogram of the full sample is shown 
above. In this figure, we can already see that the span of A whose stretch is over the minus one line seem to be always populated with the redshift, while the supernovae under this minus one line uh, tend to become scarce with redshift, and that is the disappearance that we wanted to study. Uh, in fact, the stretch evolution was already expected when looking at Rigo 18's paper, uh, because in this paper, they presented these two elements on the left and on the right. On the left, we have the stretch versus the LSSFR values of 114 supernovae from the SNF sample. The LSSFR is simply a tracer of the age of a supernova. It's called young if its progenitor uh, was young, meaning that it exploded sooner than others. And the LSSFR is deduced by its environment properties. We see that the, the stretch distributions seem to be different. A single Gaussian for the young ones and uh, a combination of that same Gaussian uh, with another low stretch mode for the old ones only. On the right, we have an analytic expression of the fraction of young stars as a function of redshift. It shows that as the redshift increases, we find an increasing ratio of young stars, those one here, uh, compared to old stars. For instance, the supernova at the end of the, uh, of the SNLS dataset uh, here um, exploded in an environment that, that was composed of approximately 55% of young stars, while the first ones of the PS1 sample exploded in an, an environment uh, composed of approximately 50% of young stars. So we had expect the, the distribution to be different because with the, this evolution and this, these distributions, we see that we indeed expect the low stretch mode here to disappear because we have more and more young stars than old stars. So thanks to these two things, we have the link between stretch and environment, and then environment and redshift. We're trying to have the mean stretch from this distribution, and it's simply the fraction of young stars times the mean of the young distribution, which is a Gaussian, so it's mu one, plus the fraction of old stars, one minus the fraction of young, uh, times uh, the mean distribution of the old stars, which is a, com a linear combination between uh, two Gaussians. Is that all right? Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. OK, OK, great. Uh, so then uh, these parameters were uh, computed using our complete sample. And uh, you can see uh, that here we've cut the sample in six pins of equal sample size to plot the mean redshift and mean x1. The redshift here is in log scale. And uh, with that um, data set, we plotted two things. The mean of all the data in orange here, uh, which is constant and our analytic model and its error in blue line and band. When comparing the quality of fit between this model and this data and this orange model, which is just constant and the data, we find a delta chi-square of, of approximately 30, indicating that our model fits better to the data than the model shown in orange, which is uh, pretty clear from uh, the evolution of the data and the model. Uh, but we're not saying it's the best model of all. We, we, we have to test the viability of this model. And for that, we implemented a suite of different parameterizations that are shown on the x-axis here, and whose quality of fit from our base model is shown uh, on the y-axis using an estimator that penalizes uh, the addition of free para parameters to prevent overfitting. We don't want to have 569 parameters to describe our 569 data set. We want to have the, the more, the, the, the simplest model here. Uh, so for example, we have the Howell plus drift model, which is made of one Gaussian for each age distribution. Uh, in our base model, the old ones, is a, a, a Gaussian mixture. 
the asymmetric uh, model here is only uh, fitting the complete uh, stress distribution with one asymmetric Gaussian. We have other consent models, such as our base model with a fixed ratio of young stars, so without an evolution. And, uh, and uh, to understand the points that are here, we have made uh, the, the full markers here and here represent the drifting models with a delta z z sorry evolution while the open markers uh, represent constant models the transparent ones show the result for the conservative sample as we said earlier so what we are reading here is that any model that doesn't include uh, an evolution with uh, the redshift is um and now uh, easy, oh, sorry yeah, is automatically excluded as a suitable description description of the data relative to our base model. For instance, the asymmetric one has 10 to the minus six uh, chance to describe the data as well as our base model. This uh, strongly uh, favors the fact that uh, the stretch is evolving with the redshift. And now I hope I, I, I hope you have understood the title of this presentation. Um, but now, where does it play a role? The stretch underlying distribution is not something new. For instance, the beams with bias correction modeling or BBC modeling uh, is a technique that uses a per sample asymmetric Gaussians uh, that was excluded on the previous slide to correct data for selection effects meaning that they extrapolate what is missed after the redshift limit. So on this figure, uh, we, re we represented the normed stretch histogram in gray here of our complete GS1 sample. So there is X1 on the X axis and uh, on top of uh, three things. The first is the BBC modeling's asymmetric distribution in green. We have a full line and band that uh, represent our determination of the asymmetric Gaussian's parameters. And the dashed line is uh, the, the authors of the PBC modeling's parameters. Uh, they are very close to each other, which indicates that we did get rid of selection effects with our cut. Whereas the PBC, which is a pretty complex uh, model, takes the selection effects to correct the sample. Um, then there is our bimodal model. Because the, ampli the amplitude of each mode depends on the fraction of young stars, at low redshift we will have, so in blue in the figure, we will have uh, more old stars, and so we will have more of the low stretch mode uh, that than, uh, high, than at higher redshift, uh, which are represented in red here. The mean distribution of uh, the, this base model on the redshift range of PS1 is shown in the black uh, line and band. The, the, the point of that figure is that we see uh, that the asymmetric Gaussian goes through the middle of the bimodal distribution. For instance, it's overestimating the number of supernovae at a stretch of minus uh, 0.5, 0.7, and it uh, underestimates it at uh, minus 1.7 approximately. Uh, that means that the SN, the, the supernova's bias corrected standardized magnitude, if we use the underlying stretch to correct for what we don't see, uh, it could be biased by an ill modeling of the true underlying stretch distribution which could have an impact on the measurements of uh, cosmological parameters. Uh, we've reached the end of my talk. Uh, during this presentation, uh, I introduced you to the concept of observational cosmology using uh, Spernobay uh, 1A, showing you that uh, it's a powerful co cosmological tool. And then we talked about um, 
the need for increased systematic knowledge in order to reduce uh, the, 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 the dispersion uh, before uh, showing how we managed to implement a model of a uh, stretch that allowed us to uh, create new analytical models that would uh, uh, aim at reducing this dispersion. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, please don't hesitate to ask any question. Thanks a lot, Nora, for your talk. Uh, are there any questions? I have one. Yeah. Uh, first, thanks for your talk. Um, okay. My question was about to, to try to take into account the environment in these uh, supernovae studies, right? Yeah, it's basically a uh, house study. Yeah, and, and you try to see how is uh, the mean uh, distribution, uh, the, the mean total intensity of supernovae evolve with the redshift. Yeah. And, and if I understand well, you try to do it from a statistical approach, looking at the uh, supernovae you have, you have per redshift beam. Uh, well, sorry, I'm going back a few slides. Uh, where is it? Um, yeah, basically, yeah, we, we have this sample and we want to know uh, what kind of distribution would fit better uh, the data that is here. Yeah, so, so here is my question. Um, so, so somewhere there are some physics here. Is the supernovae related to also star formation? And yeah. kind of curve, isn't it directly related to the SFR? Uh, function star formation it is uh it is exactly and sorry what were you done with your question so my question is can you can you could not you directly derive this function that you are trying to measure from your supernovae directly from the sfr studies that have been done in galaxies uh yeah that's actually what we use here uh, we use the LSSFR to test the environment of the supernova. The LSSFR is the local specific star formation rate. Uh, okay. Basically, it's uh, the ratio between the star formation rate and the mass of uh, the galaxy, I think, yeah. Uh, but locally around the star. Uh, 10, oh. 10 parsec, I think. Okay, thank you. So this is this is what I didn't understood. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the the main point is that uh, what was I saying earlier? Um, here, uh, the 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 point is that we think it's evolving because of the disappearance of minus minus one uh, stretch, and if we can link the stretch to the environment environment and the environment to the redshift we can have uh, a stretch with the redshift which we which could could be used to uh, determine this evolution mm -hmm. the link between stretch and environment is made through the lssfr and uh, the link between environment and redshift is done with uh, the delta z evolution of Rigo et al which gives the fraction of young stars as a function of redshift Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Your, your, your question? Yeah, completely. Yeah. So, okay. what is the uh, conclusion on H uh, zero measurement at the end? We have no idea how it affects uh, cosmology yet, because uh, well, we have to implement that model in other tools. Uh, but we are actually planning on uh, implementing it it into the SNANA uh, package, which could then uh, show us on how it would affect the H0 uh, tension, and the H0 measurement. Okay, because you know that there are some people who don't believe in supernovae, especially people from CMB. So somewhere would you, do you think, what is your intuition? Do you think your study will confirm CMB people thought? Uh, basically, the, 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 the tension in cosmology about H0 is that uh, the CMB uh, and the Planck measured uh, a value, uh, 68, I think. And then with supernovae, uh, recental uh, 
uh, data mandate at, I don't know, 60, 75, I think. And there is a big tension between the two. And uh, Resetal did it, did it with Supernovae. So I guess each uh, side the, the think uh, Supernovae don't work or CMB doesn't work. Uh, but actually this kind of study could um, help in reducing the H0 tension because um, when we measure a, a, a supersonoma flux, we have to know its uh, absolute magnitude. And for that, we need um, a calibration sample. This is made on the Cephades. The Cephades are uh, a group of stars which are pretty uh, close to us that have um, uh, a variable, um, a periodical uh, luminosity that gives us, uh, which gives us the distance uh, pretty neatly. We have a calibrator for, for, for the distance and then we, we get uh, the um, absolute magnitude from this close to a sample and we say the absolute magnitude is taken from here and we extrapolate it to every other stars. But the, this calibration sample is on the surface, which are closed stars. And closed stars, as we say, are mostly uh, young, you know, mostly, uh, oh, well, they are young stars. Uh, the, 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 the LSSFR is uh, high on these samples and we may think that there is a bias on the H0 tension because of this calibration sample, and it could reduce it, I think, um, uh, from five sigmas to, 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 to one sigma, I think. So there is still some improvement to, to, to make on the calibration of supernovae in order to determine the cosmological parameters. Uh, but there is, I think, some... Uh, strong things to do here, uh, collaborating between uh, the, the surveys. That there is still some steps to come into agreement and we can work on that, I think. Does that uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Are there uh, other questions? So if not, I, I have one, a quick one. When you when you showed the um, comparison model plot, can you go yep. back to that just to make sure yep. I have understood? So here yep. you're you're comparing all the models with respect to your base model. Yeah. Or, okay. So well, uh, in fact, we just uh, computed all the AIC for all the models. It's like a chi square. It's really really like a a chi square, but it penalizes uh, three par par parameters. And we found that ours had the lowest AIC. So we just took that for the reference uh, sample, uh, but we, we, we could have had a point higher than that, but we just take the higher uh, point as the reference one. Okay. 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 Yeah, so, so basically the, what you define as acceptable is in reference of uh, your model, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. It's really important to, to, to see that we can't know about the true underlying uh, distribution. We don't even know what that means, but we can compare the quality of fit of models. And we're just saying that having uh, an evolution with redshift seems really to be strongly better than not having one. That's it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there other questions? Otherwise, let's thank Nora again for <laughs> the very nice presentation and very interesting talk.